So um, this is uh, a standard set of slides that we'll start with um, for each module. Uh, we're going to have eight modules, four modules um, today, and then four modules tomorrow. And these are just to remind everyone about the Creative Commons license, to remind that you are actually in uh, now module one and that this is the machine learning for bioinformatics. So these things will, will look similar or the same. Um, and then the schedule, uh, something that Nia's already outlined a little bit. Um, we'll try and keep to <coughs> schedule as, as much as possible. This first one is a fairly lengthy one and um, may take uh, a little bit more than the hour and a half we scheduled. So it's good that we've started a little early. Um, you can see that we're going to have um, three different breaks and none of them are really long breaks. And that's partly because we're trying to accommodate um, so many different time zones. Um, so they are pseudo coffee breaks, pseudo lunch breaks, pseudo dinner breaks for some people. Um, hopefully that gives you enough time. And because it's virtual, obviously people can cut in and out if they need to grab a bite to eat or um, go to the restroom. The, um, certainly I encourage people to um, uh, ask questions. The unfortunate thing with Zoom is I can't see people putting their hands up. And so I'm gonna to have to depend on um, TAs or, or Nia to sort of let me know if there's been uh, a question or an issue that's been raised and whether that's in showing up in Slack or other things. So um, reaching out, I guess this is something you guys will have to um, do through any means possible, but it is, it is a course that it's a, you know, a relatively small group that we've got. Um, hopefully everyone will get to know everyone and feel comfortable uh, asking questions and interrupting. Um, so we've already gone through this with the, the Slack. Um, and as I say, because I don't have access while I'm lecturing, this is something that um, the TAs and Nia can probably ask, answer. But then if the question is directed to me, um, they'll interrupt me uh, and I will um, um, sort of field the question as we can. Um, I, I don't know, did we go through the breakout room process or do people know how to do that? Nia, is there anything that we need to fill people in about the breakout rooms? I don't think so. I'm happy to manage those. I'll be here the whole time. Okay, great. So, um, it's been great to have a bit more background about everyone's own background. Um, the, um, I think what I want to do is sort of, um, as I say, temper expectation that some of you are uh, and have been doing machine learning perhaps for a long time. Some of you, um, this is perhaps your first exposure to machine learning. So it's pretty diverse in terms of people's background and experience. Some of you I know are relatively new to programming. Others have been doing it for most of their adult lives. Um, likewise, there's quite a diversity in terms of your interests as it relates to bioinformatics. Um, so I think what you need to understand is that this course is, is more of an introduction um, uh, to machine learning. Um, it's, um, in this case, we're gonna try and give you guys some background in, in, in machine learning. Uh, we're going to go into some of the gory details of how algorithms work. Um, we're gonna use some relatively simple examples um, because I think it's, remember, it's important to remember we've got, it's just a two day course. Um, we are not going to take you from you know, knowing nothing to machine learning to becoming an expert at the end of two days. Um, and likewise, some of the more challenging bioinformatics problems that you may have, um, we're not gonna solve them um, in the two-day workshop. But what we're trying to do is give you the foundation to potentially address them, but also to introduce you to people, namely people like the TAs and also maybe some of the students here who might also be able to work with you um, to help solve some of these problems using machine learning. Now, for this particular module, we're going to introduce not only machine learning, but we're also going to show some everyday examples of machine learning, some of which you may not be aware of, um, but 
I think are useful to understand. Um, then we're gonna look at <coughs> some examples of machine learning and bioinformatics and genomics and applications. Again, this might be new to some of you, others may be well aware of them. Um, then we're gonna go through the standard machine learning workflow. And this is really important because even for people who've been doing machine learning for a long time, um, they often miss at least one of the key steps in machine learning. And it's very problematic for the whole field. And so I really wanna emphasize this workflow for people. And then we'll talk about Google Colab. Um, this was done as part of your um, pre-reading. I wanted to make sure, we also wanted to make sure that people understood about how to use Colab, class website and code repository. Um, so this is, as I say, just laying the foundation to uh, both the course and to machine learning. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions at this stage? Of course, I can't see anyone raising hands, but um, if not, then we'll go ahead. Um, anyways, we know that machine learning is really powerful, and I think people have seen its applications. Uh, as I said before, a two-day course is not going to make you an expert. And what we're trying to give you is a taste of machine learning and hopefully inspire you to do that um, and to use it more and more in your own work. People who actually do machine learning for a living um, typically have already taken computing science degrees or advanced degrees in math. Um, people who dabble in machine learning can kind of come into it through the back door. And this is one of these back doors that we're offering. But as we'll show you, there's also some new approaches, new methods that allow you to do, um, I guess, known machine learning techniques or apply known machine learning techniques with minimal expertise. And so this is making machine learning much more accessible. What we're gonna spend the first um, two or three lectures on is just showing you uh, some of how difficult machine learning is um, in terms of both the math, um, but, it's sort of like, you don't need to know how to build a car to drive a car, but we wanna show you a little bit about how the cars are built so that you can drive the car. And so the second day is gonna be more teaching you how to drive the car. Um, what you may have gathered from the pre-reading and um, the general introduction to the course is that we're gonna be using Python and that we're gonna be using the Google Colab uh, which is a programming environment that Google offers. Um, we have R code for almost all of the modules, and I know that a couple of you um, are R programmers. Um, and so we wanted to make this, I guess, bilingual in the sense of being both Python and R. Um, all the code is available. And because we're using Colab, we don't have to install Python or a Python uh, programming environment. So this just makes it easier for everyone because we know everyone has different operating systems, different versions of operating systems, and uh, different computers. So by working with Colab, everyone is sort of um, working on the same environment. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, or at least introduce the concept of machine learning here. So first the definition of learning, which I think what we're it's exactly what we're doing right now. So we are organisms and we're improving our performance uh, by getting some experience. Um, so we are learning um, about new tasks, new approaches, and then the field of machine learning. So machine learning is actually a subfield of AI or artificial intelligence. And it's really trying to do or get computers to do what humans do naturally or what most animals are able to do naturally. So the computer improves its performance in a task through experience or through data. And it's, it's also considered a technique um, to sort of self-program if you want, that allows you to make predictions or decisions without explicitly being programmed to do so. And that's a really important distinction from, from general programming. The other thing to remember is that machine learning is not that new. Um, Arthur Samuel is considered, I guess, the, the founder of machine learning, and he provided a definition back in 1956. So that's almost 70 years ago. So machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. 
And so he was actually even working on checkers as uh, sort of an example of AI or ML uh, techniques. And interesting, the checkers problem uh, was solved about 20 years ago here at the University of Alberta. Um, so from 56 to roughly 1996 uh, is how long it took to solve checkers. So when we think about programming, uh, traditionally, if you're trying to say write a program that says hello world and asks you for your name, um, you would um, provide um, some input, um, maybe the text that you want to write. Uh, you'd explain how you want the text uh, written and what sort of input. And it goes through an algorithm program and it produces some output uh, like, you know, hello world, um, good morning, your name, whatever. Um, the difference from regular programming and machine learning is that what you do rather than providing just the input, you usually provide both input and output uh, as, as the data set. Um, it might be what we call labeled data. And rather than running it through what we call a program, we run it through a learner or a model. Now, technically it is a program, but the terminology used in machine learning is, is a learner. And the net output is effectively a program um, that is able to um, understand the input and output so that if you give it some new input, it'll be able to generate appropriate output. So another way of describing it might be, think of a program to do addition or multiplication or um, differentiation. Um, we have an input um, and we say, what is one plus one? And the program will do its calculation and it will come up with the answer two. In the case of machine learning, instead of giving the question, what is one plus one? We give it a whole lot of examples of addition, one plus zero, one plus one, one plus two. These represent both the input which is on the left side of the equation and the output, which is on the right side. We want it through a learner. And from all of these examples, what we have is the result of a program or a model for doing general addition. So then we can say, what is eight plus eight? Even though it hasn't seen that before, it will have learned the process and will come up with the correct answer. And this is very much how we learn we often work from examples. We don't think about addition as doing some kind of and operation through Boolean logic. Uh, we have just seen lots of examples that our math teachers showed us, and we started to get the, the, the drift of what addition is. Obviously, we had to start memorizing certain things, um, but that is how we learn through examples. The other thing that we can do um, is with machine learning, uh, start doing, I think, more unusual things. So if we gave um, a regular program that could have learned how to do one plus one, and um, these are some of the answers that we wrote, which are all different versions of two, um, the program that we wrote to do addition would actually have no idea uh, what it is and what we're trying to do. But a, a learning program, especially one that's designed to do character recognition, would be able to do this. And so the input might be a whole bunch of um, different ways of writing the number two, and then a label saying that all of these are the number two. And so we will have a program that will learn how to do recognition of letters or numbers. So, what we use computers for primarily um, has been as, as a mechanism to do tedious operations and to do those better, faster, more accurately. So math is an example where computing and traditional computing excels at. Computers calculate and solve equations and perform mathematical operations much better than we do. You can also see conventional computing um, used in, in spell checking. Um, it just simply does lookup tables, looks for you know, cosine similarities between words and says, did you really mean this word? Um, so that's another rapid lookup. 
we can all do spell checking by looking up a dictionary, but the computer is faster. So machine learning are doing essentially more difficult tasks than what we can do normally through conventional computing. These are tasks that require not just simple lookups or simple math. So, you know, in addition to spell checking, you can also have Microsoft Word do grammar checking. And grammar checking is not a simple lookup thing. It has to understand elements of context. Um, it has to understand um, um, past, present, and future tenses. Um, it has to understand where you place commas and periods. And, and that's something that takes a long time to learn. And actually, most people have never really learned it that well. But computers with machine learning can. Likewise, the ones that can interpret speech or do image or face recognition. Those are difficult tasks for a computer using traditional programming, but they are well suited to machine learning. Um, so again, just to emphasize the, the difference between machine learning and conventional computing, because this is something that a number of people tend to get confused on, that they just say, I've got lots of data, I need to crunch through the data. So I'm not going to use conventional computing. I'm just going to use machine learning. And in some cases, you know, number crunching is best done through conventional computing. In some cases, statistics is best done through conventional computing. Uh, even multivariate statistics, best done through conventional computing. Um, so being able to recognize when you should use conventional computing and when you should use machine learning is really, really important. Now, the other thing to remember is that we'll be using and sometimes alternatively flipping between the term ML, machine learning, and AI for artificial intelligence. They are somewhat distinct. Uh, certainly AI is the older field that's probably been around since the uh, late 1940s. Machine learning is looked on as a subfield AI traditionally was viewed on expert systems. So AI for um, the checkers problem. It used expert systems. It had extensive lookup tables. It had large amounts of data, very complex algorithms. The checkers program behaved like it was a good checkers player, um, but it was all pre-coded as a conventional program. So the machine learning approach um, uses what's called probabilistic computing. Um, it makes use of fairly advanced statistical methods and optimization. And those are the components of a machine learning model or learner. Um, now, because they still, the results mimic what human experts can do, um, AI and machine learning have somewhat merged. And many of the people who started in AI have shifted their focus and their strengths into machine learning. And so they may do both, or they may simply focus on machine learning. So the example um, in terms of things like facial recognition, uh, you can get both for recognizing faces to focus on in your cell phone cameras or uh, facial recognition for security systems or um, passcodes or using fingerprint um, recognition for signing in onto your Macs or whatever. Those have been around, but those are examples of machine learning because they're recognizing patterns. Um, on the other hand, uh, some of you might have been around, although maybe most of you just have heard about it as a historical um, development, which was Deep Blue, where a computer beat the world champion and at the time considered probably the world's best chess player ever, Gary Kasparov, in chess. In this case, it wasn't using the traditional machine learning approaches. It was an expert system with huge amounts of data, vast numbers of previously played chess games all loaded onto a computer. So it played like an expert, but it didn't use probabilistic computing the way that machine learning does. Um, some of you might have been around, this is more than 10 years ago, but at the time it was a rather dramatic demonstration 
where they took um, two Jeopardy champions, uh, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, and they played against a computer called Watson. And um, Watson is a, an AI system and a machine learning system. And you can see how Watson is standing there as the blank box with this bright looking brain in the background. Um, and um, Watson clobbered um, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, um, and it you know, won the prize. But to, to build Watson, it took um, more than a thousand people coding for four years and almost a billion dollars to create the program. At the time, it had to do a lot of things that were really cutting edge. So it had to be, be able to use natural language processing to recognize the text or the, the answer so that it could then compose a question. It had to be able to come up with very fast information retrieval, um, automated reasoning, but it also started using some early components of machine learning. It had large collections of encyclopedias, dictionaries, um, at the time, some of the internet, but lots of newswire stories. Um, and since Watson has, was developed and you know, sort of demonstrated that it was smarter than anyone else, IBM's continued to develop it. And so they've added elements that can give it the ability to see and hear and read and interpret, taste and talk and recommend. And in some respects, Watson at the, at the time up until 2022, seemed to be um, you know, the most advanced system. And then along came ChatGPT. Um, so that kind of put Watson in its place. Um, it's sort of the old Model T of AI and machine learning. And ChatGPT has supplanted it in a rather remarkable way. Not unlike Watson, it cost almost a billion dollars to develop. Not unlike Watson, it took hundreds of people and at least four years. It was built on a lot of academic work that was made available to it. Um, but what it's using is something called a generative pre-trained transformer model. And these are similar to graphical neural nets, which is something that Tanvir mentioned he's been working on. The transformers are a significant advance in deep learning and they really are an advance because they've modeled a function of the human brain better than other um, machine learning models. So they have things like attention units and uh, short-term and long-term memory components. They have multiple layers bound in deep neural nets. Um, all of those are things that mimic, and we know physiologically how the human brain works. And so not unexpectedly, the closer you can make your deep learning model mimic um, a biological brain, the better it does. Now, there was a thresholding point where these transformer models started to take on components and intelligence similar to humans. And that threshold happened somewhere in 2021, 22, where they started getting roughly um, 10 or 15 billion components or um, um, I guess blocks if you want. And, and this just represents the amount of text or words or tokens that were used in training and testing the model. Um, and if you pass that threshold, then it starts on taking on characteristics of, of if you want, human intelligence. GPT has um, you know, been tested on and evaluated on many things. People have had to take the SATs, the DREs, LSATs, MCATs, um, various courses, and it's done remarkably well, you know, passing them um, and getting scores usually better than some of the top scores recorded by humans. I think those of you who've used it, um, probably also know that it's sort of like a, an extended version of autofill for texting. Um, so it, if you text a lot, you notice that you can type in some words and then you have word suggestions. And essentially what GPT does is it just takes 
you know, if, if it takes one suggested word, then it'll take then another suggested word based on what it was seeing for the previous set of words, and then it'll start creating another suggested word. And so this is a generative model for creating text. And um, instead of, or unlike, say, your uh, texting tools, which will um, confuse words or, or not make too much sense, um, GPT is able to understand context, and it will make sense. So uh, I'm not sure, and maybe um, everyone who's taking this course has probably experimented a little bit with GPT. Um, and maybe we could do a quick survey um, just using Slack. Um, if we could find out how many people have used chat GPT. Um, and maybe if any of you have not used chat GPT, you could also let us know just so that we have a better idea. Um, I was impressed when it first came out because we ran into someone who's a, a songwriter and um, he was already using um, chat GPT to write um, some fun and funny songs. Um, I've seen people use chat GPT to really improve some of their uh, cover letters. Um, and almost everyone in my group now uses GPT to help identify and correct the coding. Um, the other thing that's important to distinguish um, between machine learning and AI is another facet called data mining. Um, both machine learning and data mining use a lot of data and a lot of them can, uh, whether it's machine learning or data mining can be used at some level to predict things. Um, machine learning is obviously trying to reproduce or predict information from known knowledge. Data mining typically is a way of discovering previously unknown knowledge. And this may be identifying patterns or connections in text that um, people weren't aware of. An example I know, and this is from a number of years ago, um, was connecting text that had been published in PubMed over the years. Um, some of you who've gone to the eye doctor have had atropine added to your eyes and that dilates your pu pupils. So that was a known fact. But then another known fact was that people with Down's syndrome, when given atropine, their eyes will dilate, but the dilation will persist not for just a few hours, but literally for days, sometimes weeks. So that's another known fact. A third known fact is that people with Down syndrome tend to develop Alzheimer's disease very early in life, sometimes as early as 25 or 30, and almost universally by the age of 40. So there's a connection between atropine and eyes, atropine and Down syndrome, and Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. And so those three facts uh, were connected uh, by data mining tools. And it came up with the assertion that atropine could be used to identify people with early stage Alzheimer's. And so they tried this, and these are people who had, I guess, mild cognitive impairment. They put atropine in their eyes, and what they found is that their eyes remain dilated for uh, days. And so an atropine test is a potential method for identifying or detecting people with Alzheimer's disease. So that's an example of data mining, connecting known facts to create new facts or new knowledge. That's where knowledge graphs come in. Now, the other thing um, we, we need to distinguish, and people brought this up in their introductions about their own work and interests, is the distinction between machine learning and deep learning. So deep learning is, is sort of a new phenomenon that's appeared over the last roughly 10 years. It's a sub-discipline of machine learning, which is a sub-discipline of artificial intelligence. Um, what you're using in deep learning is that you're extending neural networks, which most of you have probably heard about, but these are now deep neural networks. So there's many more hidden layers. And by having more hidden layers in the structure of the neural network, you're able to learn more complex patterns, make smarter predictions, 
and in many cases actually do feature selection without um, manual intervention. Um, so some of these deep neural nets have been evolved to be more than just simply neural nets. Some of them have recurrent neural network structures, convolutional neural network structures. Some are also called deep belief networks, um, graphical neural networks, another example of a deep neural network. Now, interestingly, um, for those of you who are not in Canada, um, the point about deep learning is a, a source of great national pride in Canada because the two people who really started the whole field of deep learning live in Canada. Jeffrey Hinton is at the University of Toronto and Yashua Benjo is at the University of Montreal. Both of these individuals are recognized globally as the, the godfathers of deep learning. They're the people who've developed the technologies like transformers, deep neural nets. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton was at the very beginning, early stages of even just machine learning and artificial neural nets. Um, both of them won the 2018 Turing Award. That's the Nobel Prize for Computing. Um, both have been named uh, Fellows of the Royal Society in London and Canada and many other places. Um, and they have also sounded the alarm over concerns that um, uh, machine learning, at least at the level of chat GPT, has reached the point of near consciousness and have said that we need to rein in what we're doing or be more cautious. But as I said, much of the technology that is now um, everyone's talking about uh, was developed by these two individuals. And so many of the programmers that are in Google and in OpenAI and all the other places trained in either Toronto, Montreal, or Alberta, which are the three hubs for machine learning in Canada. Now, in terms of machine learning, uh, there are three approaches. There's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Uh, the supervised learning is the one that we'll generally focus on, and it's the example I was giving you where you have an input and an output, a desired output, or something that's called labeled data. And the idea is to learn the rules that allow you to map inputs to outputs. So if you're given you all kinds of questions or answers or lists of addition facts, you know, zero plus one, one plus one, two plus two, those are um, tasks that are called supervised learning. It's the most common. Unsupervised learning is basically um, clustering. It's learning to uh, work with unlabeled data and ways of you know, grouping things. So if I give you uh, a whole bag of just loose socks, um, your natural tendency is to do unsupervised clustering. Um, you will try and match the socks based on their color and size. So if you see two red socks, you will try and pair them up. Um, you might also assess if they're the same you know, hue of red or whether they're the same size. Um, but um, pairing up socks is an example of sort of clustering uh, or just unsupervised learning. An example of reinforcement learning is um, essentially being given continuous feedback. Um, so uh, if people are doing um, neural training or trying to get alpha waves and beta waves from their brain scans generated, they will have sort of this continuous video game. Are you getting your alpha waves or beta waves or delta waves uh, maximized. Uh, if you're training a dog, similar sort of thing where you uh, throw a ball, get the dog to fetch, and every time it does the right job, you pet it and, and praise it. That's reinforcement leading, uh, learning, and, and it's obviously a very effective method. Reinforcement learning was used to optimize the performance of, of chat GPT. So supervised learning was done first, and then reinforcement learning was done to improve it. Um, as I said, the applications for these different 
approaches um, for machine learning are specific. So supervised learning, really useful for um, classification problems, really useful for performing linear or nonlinear regression. So supervised learning, um, obviously used in chat GPT, face recognition, voice recognition, spam filtering, um, recommendation systems. Unsupervised learning is for clustering, also for pattern finding. People have used it in seismic data analysis, uh, ECG data analysis. Reinforcement learning, uh, often used in you know, video game training, um, uh, game playing, but also in autonomous car driving. So if anyone's been visiting San Francisco recently, maybe some of you've tried um, in sitting in some of these autonomous driving vehicles. Some of you may have also been in Tesla's um, self-driving mode. Those were all developed um, and refined using reinforcement learning. And I'm gonna maybe just take a little bit of a break because as I say, I've been um, uh, just able to see only the slides. And so uh, maybe I'll query just the TAs. Did you guys get any feedback from students on Slack about whether they had used chat GPT or not? Yeah, so we have a, a sort of informal poll up. If you haven't voted already, you can just click a reaction. Um, and everyone who's voted has voted that they have used chat GPT. Okay, and then I guess the ones that didn't vote haven't used it, I guess. <laughs> uh, nobody's clicked the no button. So I think they just haven't voted. Okay, all right, that's good to know. And then, um, and it just also should make sure is, is the audio coming in okay? People are able to hear me. And has anyone had any questions? I got a thumbs up indicating that we can hear you great. Um, I don't see any raised hands. All right, so I'll carry on. Um, so we talked about the fact that we call uh, machine learning systems, we call them learners or models. And the, the models that are most commonly used in machine learning fall into many different categories. And we'll talk about some of them in detail. Others we'll sort of briefly mention. Um, so the simplest machine learning models are decision trees. And if you put a whole bunch of trees together, you get a forest. Uh, and if you do that randomly, you'll get a random forest or a wild forest. So those are um, the simplest ones. We'll talk about them. Another common model is an artificial neural network. We will get into those ones. These are the early versions, although just adding more hidden layers can make them into deep neural nets. There are other tools called support vector machines, genetic algorithms, Bayesian networks, convolutional neural networks, graphical neural networks, transformers. Um, trying to learn about the architecture for each of them and understanding the math for them um, is a multi-month course. Um, so we're not gonna do this in two days. I will briefly describe some of them. Um, but in terms of the general applications, I, I think most people in this course are aware of them, um, but some may be um, something you weren't aware of before. So obviously self-driving cars, uh, game playing, um, particularly um, more sophisticated games. We've seen examples of face and fingerprint recognition, traffic sign recognition for self-driving, um, stock trading, spam filtering, speech and handwriting recognition, um, question answering, which is what most people use ChatGPT for, um, resource and computing data management. Um, people have used it to simulate the brain. Um, it's obviously used in medical diagnostics. And then of course, almost everyone here is interested in how can we use machine learning in, in bioinformatics. So the examples for speech recognition, again, if people have tools like Google Home or Alexa or Siri, um, they've probably used it. So that's probably almost everyone on this uh, Zoom course. But the critical thing is that you're taking an analog signal, your voice, it has to be converted to a digital uh, input. 
And then a pattern recognition has to be done. Part of that uses feature extraction. Early days of speech recognition used a, a tool called the hidden Markov model. But now most of these use things like LSTMs, long short-term memory methods. Obviously you can use GPT type methods, uh, some kind of deep neural net, but what it does is it parses um, the noise that comes out of your voice into segregated speech patterns to get the words, which then become the commands, which then um, um, do what you've asked Alexa, Siri, or Google Home to do. If you've ever had issues with your credit card, um, fraud prevention has gone from something that was mostly reported by individuals that my credit card has been stolen or I'm seeing all kinds of charges on my credit card that I didn't know I made to things where it's almost preemptive. Um, so some of you, if you've traveled, um, may find that you're suddenly your credit card is locked. Um, this is a case where um, they're using computers and algorithms to uh, monitor your purchases. And so if you were in uh, Canada one day and then you're in Australia the next day making a large purchase, um, that may be identified by the fraud checking programs and saying, this is unusual. You don't normally go to Australia and you don't normally buy cars. Um, and so it would flag it and might freeze your um, um, credit card. So it uses information about unusual purchases, unusual locations, your purchase history, and then extracts patterns. And it also knows what sort of things people will buy and not buy. Uh, and these are highly personalized and essentially everyone who has a credit card has some profile that's been generated by the credit card agency, which is largely helping to protect you from credit card fraud. Another example um, was done, and I remember hearing this a few years ago, uh, where um, vendors like Amazon and other um, commercial enterprises um, track what you're doing and are using on the web. And advertisers are also very, very interested in this. And it was a case of um, uh, a teenager, a uh, young girl um, had her um, purchases and her browsing information being monitored, um, in which in fact it's done by everyone uh, and if you ever use internet, basically everything you click on is being tracked. Um, that information was sold to advertising agencies. And what um, this young girl's parents started noticing is that catalogs started arriving in their mail um, and uh, gift cards and promotional information and free samples started arriving in the mail, um, all about having baby. Um, anyways, um, later, um, some months later, the parents learned that their young daughter was in fact pregnant and what she had been doing was looking for information about, um, you know, diapers and uh, uh, baby blankets and bottles and other things on the web. And so the advertising agencies knew about her pregnancy long before her parents did. And again, this is an example of sort of pattern finding and how um, I guess ad agencies are now probably more aware about uh, things that our children are doing than we are. Um, one of the first applications of machine learning towards, um, I guess, a commercial application was something called the Netflix Challenge, uh, which was held in 2009. So Netflix, didn't just appear during COVID. Uh, Netflix has been around for uh, 15 years or more. Um, and they were uh, noted for their recommendation system, uh, which was um, um, a heuristic algorithm that was programmed conventionally. But Netflix had collected huge amounts of data about what people like to watch and what they like to watch in sequence. So, um, you know, if someone liked to watch all the Jurassic Park movies, then Netflix might recommend other movies that were either similar in style to other dinosaur movies or maybe 
uh, movies like um, uh, other adventure um, series. Um, and the key thing with Netflix is that it had this huge data set and it really didn't know what to do with it. And at the time, machine learning was sort of emergent. And so they offered a million dollars to a programmer, any programmer, who could come up with a better algorithm. And the winning algorithms were basically all machine learning algorithms. Um, and Netflix continues to use these same machine learning algorithms to, to make recommendations. Um, and the winner you know, didn't have to be spectacularly better, but it was still at least 10% better than the algorithm that Netflix had paid millions of dollars to build using conventional coding. Face recognition, again, if you have a cell phone, um, it does face recognition to do autofocusing. Um, but if you have security systems on your computer or your cell phone that are based on facial recognition, same sort of thing. It's machine learning where it's looking at key features. So it's doing feature extraction. And if you know a little bit about um, face recognition and art, uh, you know that there are some key points on a person's face distance between eyes, height between eyes and eyebrow, uh, forehead um, dimensions, the golden rule or golden triangle rule about where eyes, nose, and mouth fit. All of those things are used to identify faces and to distinguish between faces. And it's just about as good as a fingerprint and obviously being unique. Humans are exceptional at face recognition. Um, dogs are pretty good. Most other animals aren't. Um, so again, it's a part of the brain that's pretty highly developed in humans and which now computers can do a good job with. Uh, I mentioned reinforcement learning. Uh, these are some of the early days uh, photos of, of what um, self-driving cars were doing. They always had to do it in the desert because they would find these cars uh, would go wildly off in the different directions and they didn't want to have them hit trees or run over people. Um, obviously things have gotten better because the self-driving cars are now um, in San Francisco, uh, generally doing a, an okay job. Um, but it took many years. And in fact, it's largely because of more recent developments in deep learning and improvements with reinforcement learning that self-driving cars are doing a pretty good job. Now, in terms of applications of machine learning, you know, some of you have already mentioned things that you'd like to do and others where you do know what's being used. We're going to show you examples of um, applications of machine learning in secondary structure prediction and gene finding. And these are historically some of the first applications of machine learning. Um, but there are much more. I mean, sequence motif finding, GWAS analysis, disease diagnosis, DNA sequencing, spectral analysis and prediction, drug discovery, protein structure prediction. The list goes on and on. My own experience in machine learning started more than 25 years ago. We used um, neural nets to help um, do some of the very first work in metabolomics. Um, we've done used machine learning in, in cancer, uh, susceptibility prediction. We were looking from SNPs back 20 years ago. We've used it obviously in cancer prediction and prognosis and have written, I guess, one of the first reviews about machine learning in cancer. That's from 2006. Uh, we've applied machine learning to do um, protein secondary and tertiary structure prediction. Um, we've used machine learning to predict spectra. Interestingly, the first official AI program uh, ever written was called Dendril. Um, and that program was to do um, mass spectral prediction. Um, that was developed in Berkeley, and people are still continuing to develop versions of Dendril, and the version we called CFMID was um, is the latest version. It's currently the best method for predicting mass spectra. Um, We've used machine learning in GWAS uh, analysis. We've calculated um, optimal SNP panels from GWAS studies to develop um, risk, polygenic risk scores or uh, predictive markers for many different conditions and diseases. We've used something called support vector machine methods in random forests uh, to help perform the regression 
um, and to calculate um, the optimal sensitivity and specificity uh, combinations for these predictive polygenic risk scores. Um, examples other people have in terms of um, SNP typing. Uh, this is an example where they used uh, machine learning um, with swarm clustering. Um, so this is unsupervised machine learning. Um, and this is trying to identify SNPs for heat sensitivity, taking people who were highly heat sensitive. And this also can refer to your taste buds if you're sensitive to hot chili peppers or not. It's also whether you're sensitive to um, heat from warm packages or not. Some of you may know of people who can hold very hot containers and not flinch and others uh, just holding a warm glass is painful. Um, so this was an interesting facet. In fact, um, the heat sensitive um, analysis of TRIP-V1 and TRIP-A1 were I think Nobel Prize was awarded a few years ago for that work. Um, but initially they looked at 278 SNPs that potentially were related to heat sensitivity. And using the swarm analysis, this is able to reduce the, the biomarker panel down to 31. This is similar to what we did with the polygenic risk scores, but rather than using SVMs, they use this swarm analysis. But these are diff different methods for doing separations of multiple features or factors. Some of you may have used or have worked with or heard about um, Oxford Nanopore's um, DNA sequencing system. Uh, so there's, it's called the Minion or Mini Ion. Um, the, um, it's been under development for more than 15 years, but it uses pores, um, protein pores that are able to take in DNA. And you can connect the pores into an electrical system so that as DNA passes through the pores, we get different electrical signals. And those electrical signals are, as it turned out, correspond to different bases. A has a set signal, G, C, and T also have se separate signals, but they're also dependent on not just the individual bases, but the collection of bases. So an A beside a G will have a different signal than an A beside a T. So for years and years, um, they couldn't really get the nanopore readouts to do very well. In fact, the first ones were sort of like 50 or 60% accurate, but they would have competitions and they would encourage the community to develop um, methods to do pattern recognition of the signals, which are shown at the lower right here. And it turned out uh, through efforts, community efforts and efforts from Max or Nanopore that machine learning methods had Markov models initially, but later, um, recurrent neural nets started performing better and better. And so now the Oxford nanopore uh, has gone from sort of like 50 to 60% accuracy to like 99 or 99.5% accuracy. And that's all due to machine learning uh, and due to community efforts to come up with better algorithms and to have lots and lots of trained data or training data. So they would take regular Sanger sequencing data, run it through, and then run the same data through the nanopore. And so these are all example sets that they could use to train the system. Um, so you can apply machine learning in other areas, uh, predicting sequences, sequence specificity of RNA and DNA binding proteins, so something called deep bind. Um, and this is essentially um, using uh, motif detectors, motif scans, um, and a neural net to essentially optimize what, what's being read. So in this case, they're doing lots of feature selection, but they had huge amounts of training data, which was sort of gold standard training data. Um, and the diagram here is just sort of illustrating how they um, were doing it, but this is an older model. And in fact, they probably could have used it um, using something like UNet or a graphical neural net to do better. Uh, deep BioSeq um, uses um, a deep net neural net or convolutional neural net to analyze RNA seq data. Um, it doesn't require the sequence preprocessing or genomic alignment data. So, this is where you don't have to do sort of the feature extraction. Uh, and this is an advantage of, of 
deep neural nets or deep learning. Um, it can read fast Q data. It can also, if you input additional information about the quality of the reads, it gets better. People have adapted it to single cell sequencing and chip sequence data. So again, this is, um, it's out there. And in fact, you'll find many, many machine learning tools on GitHub that are uh, performed very well for specific tasks. Um, people have been using machine learning to optimize CRISPR target sequences. Um, and this has been an area of active research um, leading to guide or get the guide DNA design to make sure that you're able to um, do um, CRISPR-Cas9 mutations in, in the best way. Um, machine learning is used not only in things like cancer diagnosis and prognosis uh, from genetic data. It's also people are linking genomic data to clinical data and patient history data, uh, electronic health records, even to genealogical data. So having all of that data, we all know that cancer sort of can run in families. So that's one relevant stat. So that's why genealogy is important. Electronic health records also give indications of what people uh, past conditions, um, smoking, environmental exposures that might be put an individual at risk, and then obviously the genomic data. So big data, machine learning is good with big data, and it's been able to improve substantially cancer risk assessment in a number of hospitals, including this Intermountain Health Unit in Salt Lake City. Um, some of you may have used um, places like 23andMe um, or other um, genomic testing um, services. Uh, 23andMe um, had data on about 600,000 people, and so they were able to start calculating things called a genetic weight, or what is your propensity or likelihood of becoming overweight. You can also now calculate you know, genetic age uh, and people can use both SNPs and uh, epigenetic data and telomere data to get that. Um, with 23andMe, they went beyond just simply saying, you know, you'll likely weigh 190 pounds. Uh, it was also suggesting things about what you could do with your diet or things to do to moderate your uh, weight gain or weight loss. Um, analysis of single nucleotide variants as opposed to SNPs, so that's SNDs and not SNPs. This is an example of using a random forest uh, and taking um, SNDs from tumor samples um, and um, including features um, beyond just the sequence. So looking at um, allele variant fractions, strand bias, unique reads, and putting all of those features into their random forest model, uh, they were able to get much better performance. So this is an example where if you use enough features, you can still use a very primitive um, machine learning technique like random forest and get really good results. So the methods that I've highlighted, I mean, some of them I mentioned like SVM, others random forest, others recurrent neural nets or deep neural nets, all of them are different methods. Um, all may have slightly different performance and their performance is sometimes a function of how well people use the feature data, a function of how well people understood the algorithms. Um, if you know machine learning reasonably well, most algorithms will, will do pretty well. So you might get a performance of 65% with the worst algorithm and 72% with the best algorithm. It's not as if you're going to go from one or two percent performance to 99.9% .9 with another algorithm. Um, if you do that, or if you see that, it probably suggests you've implemented one or more of the algorithms incorrectly. So beyond genetics, you can also apply machine learning and newborn screening. Newborn screening is usually done by mass spec. Um, so we'll take a blood spot, usually in the first few hours of life, we'll do a heel prick, put it on a card, send the card off to mass spec, and they'll look for various signals like certain amino acids, organic acids, and acyl carnitines. 
Um, but the analysis is often done by hand and uh, because hits for uh, inborn errors in metabolism are rare, people are prone to make more mistakes or over predict or over identify. So running it on, on machine learning method, uh, they're able to improve the performance by substantial amount. Maybe the, the biggest and most significant application of machine learning um, happened in 2020 and 21. And so uh, this is called alpha fold. Um, and maybe we could also do a quick survey. How many people um, on Slack have heard of alpha fold? Anyways, while you're answering the question, this is just sort of a brief outline of what AlphaFold does. But what it essentially does is it takes a sequence, a protein sequence, and it predicts the three-dimensional structure from the sequence. And people have been attempting to do this for decades, almost 50 years now. Um, and the um, you know, first approaches were to predict from sequence to secondary structure. Then people realized that if you did multiple sequence alignments, MSA, uh, that you'd get you know, improvements in both predictions of the secondary structure, but also get hints of the tertiary structure. By looking at correlated mutations for multiple um, sequences from different organisms related um, proteins, you could also start to identify um, which residues were proximal to each other and how close they were. Um, through techniques like homology modeling and energy minimization, um, you could also create three-dimensional structures. So what AlphaFold did was sort of combine all of these components into a transformer model. And um, because we'd sort of reached a threshold with large numbers of structures solved, literally billions of sequences available, uh, it was able to use this huge data set and perform um, brilliantly and to the point where in 2021, it was considered the breakthrough of the year. Um, it has essentially solved the protein folding problem, which for many years was considered unsolvable. So this is a comparison of the um, three best models. There is a method developed by um, a lab in, I think, Atlanta, uh, Jang et al. Um, there's Rosetta Fold, which is developed by David Rose. Um, and then there's Alpha Fold. Um, the Zhang model, obviously, looking at the blue versus black, they're not similar at all. Uh, looking at the green versus blue between Rosetta and natural structure, it's, it's moderately close. Uh, but the Alpha Fold model over the regions that were relevant. Um, was almost bang on. And this is a case that was a completely novel protein, novel sequence, and uh, the structure was solved um, while AlphaFold was um, running on the um, test sets. Uh, this is a COVID um, ORF, so that's why it popped out in 2019, 2020. Um, and that was shortly before AlphaFold was released. So it's a remarkable development, a remarkable uh, example of how machine learning has solved the unsolvable. Okay, I'm gonna stop a little bit here and ask if there are any questions from people. Uh, there's one in the Slack that Tanvir is um, starting to answer here, but Rachel is asking, wondering where foundation models would sit in these descriptions. There's something I'm hearing mentioned more at the moment. Um, and uh, regarding what foundation models are, models built from large data sets that you can adapt to specific problems rather than retrain or rebuild. Yeah, so the term foundation models are, are largely used for large language models um, and, and things like you know, chat GPT, um, but also from BERT type models. Um, so you could, you know, use a more generic term and say a foundation model is you know, any model that is, you know, built from the bottom up. So alpha fold technically was a foundation model, but the term more frequently refers to foundation models for large language models. And um, building a large language model from scratch is hugely computational intensive and requires 
you know, billions of, of text um, selection and, and careful assessment of what you're pulling from. Um, the foundation model also means that you have to design you know, what is your choice of architecture? Are you going to use a two-way transformer model or a one-way transformer model? Or are you going to have other layers to it or other um, additions? A flow transformer is another technique. So the foundation model also refers to what is your, your learning algorithm in addition to the, the data set. Um, so it's, it's, it's building from scratch. In the case of large language models, because they're so big and computationally intensive, most people prefer to do something called fine tuning. So they start with a foundation model and they iterate on it. Uh, it's another technique called transfer learning, same sort of thing. So you can take a pretty good model and specialize it into your application. And so many people have taken BERT, which is a large language foundational model, and adopted it to all kinds of things. So there's DNA BERT, Bio BERT, Chem BERT, Mall BERT, um, RNA BERT, um, Protein or Pro BERT, um, Dilbert, whatever. All of these things are variations on this foundational model, but they have been um, fine-tuned to adapt to a specific application. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. There's a, also an answer from Tanvir as well, which with some links, which is really helpful. Thank you. Great. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to highlight that Tanvir has put some really excellent um, information in the Slack if anyone else is interested, including an article that might be helpful. Um, and it looks like 100% of people have used ChatGPT, but only about two thirds have heard of AlphaFold before. Okay, all right, that's helpful. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about the machine learning workflow, because this is maybe the most important thing uh, for this course. Uh, if you get nothing else out of this, try and remember these, these six blocks. Um, so this is a standard workflow for uh, machine learning. And it begins uh, with a step where we're trying to define a machine learning problem and propose a solution. Um, after you do that, you construct your data set, you then transform your data set, and you can either select features or let the model select features. Um, then you start um, working with your model, and sometimes it's a matter of choosing one or many. Um, usually we suggest choosing several models and training it. After you've trained it, then you have to test your data set and validate your model. Um, and there's various routes for testing and various routes for training. And once you have your validated model, then you can start using it in real life examples to make predictions or perform classifications or to, to do general analysis or to answer questions, whatever the application. So I'm going to go a bit more into detail with each of these things. So first of all, choose your problem. And this is important because a lot of people will, will try and choose a problem. And in fact, the problem is already solved. And it may be that the you know, software exists on GitHub or actually a traditional computer program exists. It does, you know, it's not machine learning, but it's faster and better and more accurate. So when you're trying to choose a machine learning problem, you have to choose something that is not solvable mathematically. So if, if it's a matter of saying, you know, I want to calculate, um, you know, uh, or come up with latitude and longitude and convert that um, to you know, distances in kilometers. That is a mathematical problem. Um, if you're um, focusing on something that requires very special knowledge and training, um, so an example is interpreting NMR and mass spectra in chemistry. There are people who are very knowledgeable in this and that if you show them a spectrum of a molecule, within maybe a minute or less, they can figure out um, what the structure is but they're using a vast collection of knowledge, methods that they've learned, techniques to look at in terms of the spectra and patterns. Same sort of thing, there's some people who can do crossword 
uh, solutions and, and they're very fast. Um, but solving crosswords or solving um, structures from NMR spectra is not a mathematical process. It's difficult, requires specialized knowledge and training. Taking DNA sequence and saying, is this a gene or is this a, a, an enhancer or a super enhancer seg segment that requires specialized knowledge. So the best things to, to work with for machine learning are, are things where you need to find a pattern or you're looking at, at ways of classifying groups or developing some kind of regression or correlation connection. So not every problem in bioinformatics falls into those categories. And so when you're thinking about how can I use machine learning in my, my field of interest or my discipline, um, you know, think about it. So image analysis, that's ideal because that's looking for a pattern, a set of features. Sequence analysis, that's looking for patterns or a set of features. Spectral analysis, um, whether it's from chemistry or biology, um, that's ideal for machine learning. Um, but, you know, maybe calculating or predicting um, I don't know, binding affinity from sequence. That's not likely to be possible by machine learning versus predicting binding location or bind, not bind is a categorical prediction that may be more possible with machine learning. Um, the other thing to remember is that if you're trying to choose a problem, um, you should try and choose something with lots of data. So if you only have one example of your particular problem where you know, the answer is known, you're not going to work, machine learning is not going to work for you. Um, so, you know, if we had tried to use AlphaFold back in 1961 when there was only one structure and that was for hemoglobin available, there was no data. There wasn't, there wasn't sequence data, there weren't structures, there wasn't enough training data to work. AlphaFold only became possible when we'd reached sort of a threshold with the literally you know, billions of sequences and somewhere in the order of 150,000 solved X-ray structures. If we tried it you know, even 10 years earlier, there just wasn't enough data. Same thing with chat GPT. Um, it's you know, thanks to the internet, thanks to uh, many newspapers and Google scanning all known books that there became enough text information for these GPT systems to train on. So defining a problem is really important and it's probably one of the main points, uh, pain points or failure points with machine learning where people either attempt to solve something that's easily solvable with conventional programming or they attempt to solve something where there's not enough data or they're attempting to apply machine learning where it just doesn't make sense. So once you've chosen something and all of these you know, rules have sort of passed the threshold, then you can construct your data. So the data set is also important and the rule of garbage in equals garbage out is very, very true with machine learning. So you need to make sure that your data is reliable that it has to be sort of gold standard data. Uh, ideally, if we're doing uh, supervised learning, it should be labeled and the labels could be categorical, um, nominal meaning that they have names or they could be numerical. Um, and ideally what you want is the data has to have the information that you believe is relevant. Um, so if you're trying to predict, um, you know, which segment in a DNA sequence is, is an enhancer, um, you would obviously like to have labeled sets saying these ones are known enhancer sequences. 
but you might also want to know that is this, you know, what, how close is it to a gene or a set of genes? Uh, you might also want to know is it close to uh, some histone or histone binding sites? You might even want to know is it in a certain region within the chromosome? Because sometimes things at the very tips or the very center of the chromosome are handled differently. Um, that's relevant data. Those are relevant parameters that people who understand enhancers um, know um, are relevant. But if you started wanting to include you know, phase of the moon when that was measured or your astrological sign or your friend's astrological sign uh, and put that in as, as information also about how to predict enhancer positions, that's not very useful. So relevant data is key and that's where you know, some modest level of expertise about the subject is important. And again, this is a common error. People will collect the wrong data. They will collect inadequate data. Now, there are examples where machine learning has gotten so good that you don't really have to include these extra features, that if you include just enough, say, sequence data, it will start to understand that there are patterns that it's supposed to be looking for and you know, contextual information that it's supposed to know, and it'll pick that up. But that only comes with huge amounts of data and very, very sophisticated machine learning models. Now, the other thing that you have to do when you're constructing your data is you have to have ideally three types of data. One is your training data, one is your testing data, and the other one is your validation data. I'll explain this in more detail. The other thing is there isn't uh, an a priori way of knowing whether you have the right amount of data. Um, for things like transfer learning, um, you can get away with some cases with maybe a few hundred to a thousand examples. If you're trying to do um, most other types of learning uh, or developing your own machine learning algorithm, sort of a foundational type model, if you want to call it that, you may need between 10,000 to 100,000 examples. If you're doing really complex machine learning, um, and there's either very high dimensional data or where there's sort of this translation that's saying, take this DNA sequence and tell me the structure of the protein which is requires you have to know how to convert and translate DNA to protein and then go from protein to structure. Um, you'd have to that would require deep learning and it would require literally hundreds of thousands to millions of examples. And as I said, in the case of um, AlphaFold, it was probably about a billion pieces of data. So a data set construction is also really important and people often make errors in terms of either not having enough data or not dividing the data between test, training, and validation. Third step is transforming your data, selecting features. So big data usually has lots of errors in it. There'll be repeats, there'll be missing values, things will be for formatted incorrectly. You often have to cluster your data to see if there's some strange outliers. You might have to group sparse data groups together to make it a little more uniform. So you call that phase data cleaning or data cleansing. Um, if you have categorical or nominal data, it usually has to be converted to sets of numbers. So this can be done using a technique called one-hot encoding. You can also do it through embedding. Um, do it through binary encoding, but these are all methods to convert you know, names or um, words into numbers. You also have to do some normalization and transformation. It's just like statistics. And if you guys remember or know about statistics, we try and convert our data distributions into normal or Gaussian distributions. So that's called normalization or making it into a Gaussian distribution. Uh, you might do things like scaling or range scaling also to help. You'll do things like log transformations. So that 
is called data transformation or feature engineering, and it is crucial to things that use neural nets, artificial neural nets, DNNs, GNNs, and so on. Um, this is another part that many people don't know about and don't fully understand, but it is absolutely crucial to the success of machine learning. The other part is, is to do this thing called feature selection. And as I said, this is like, okay, if I want to do, you know, enhance serial identification or DNA binding identification or uh, protein structure prediction, you need to get the obvious relationships for these things. Um, keep track or use what, what people already know is important. So you know, distance to end of gene or use multiple groups of residues or include um, other contextual information as part of the feature set that you include or embed into your data set. And huge differences in performance if people are smart about their feature selection. So you can go from having a predictor that's so 10% correct all the time to something that's 99% correct by just making sure you've chosen the right features and that they're intelligent. Same thing also happens with you know poor data that um, hasn't been cleaned. You can have something that performs at a 10% rat level, clean it up, and now it's performing at 90%. Same thing with data transformation and normalization. If you don't do it, you might get something that's a total fail. Nothing works, or it's highly unstable in terms of its learning and loss functions. Transform the data, normalize it. Suddenly, it's very stable. The learning uh, functions are and trending and optimizing consistently. So these are things that, again, people tend to mess up with machine learning. This is a description of one-hot encoding. It's taking the categorical or nominal data, so we can say something is red, blue, green, um, and we can convert those colors for these objects into numbers. And so we've converted the word red to 100 and the word blue to 010, and the word green to 001. So that's one hot encoding, and that is essentially a form of a binary encoding or binary representation, and this is much better for machine learning. So one hot encoding is something we'll do in this course, um, but it, it's, it's sort of the simplest way of converting nominal or categorical data, um, but it loses context, it loses information. So embedding, is a much more powerful approach to uh, converting things. It'll uh, you know, include uh, data sequences or data strings. It can have surrounding features. It can you know, learn to identify similar values for specific features. Um, so embedding is really useful um, for things like natural language processing, main entity recognition, but it's also really good in, in when we're working with sequences, um, letters, which are like words. And so embedding has been incredibly powerful for gene finding, protein structure prediction, secondary structure prediction, alpha fold uses embedding. There's very rich embedding sets that are now out there that have taken you know, many months of um, data processing analysis. But embedding is, is a much more powerful approach but a non-trivial approach, whereas encoding is less powerful, but easy to code. Um, so here's an example of uh, one hot encoding on the left side, where we're just converting things like man, woman, boy, these are categorical or nominal labels. And you know, man is 10000, woman is 01000, boy is 0010. But there are relationships and, you know, obviously man and boy is a relationship, woman and girl's relationship, prince and man and boy are related, princess, girl and woman are related, uh, as is queen and then so on. So we could come up with not only you know, more context, um, but a richer um, matrix of data if we went over to embedding on the right side. So we can use terms like feminine new use and loyalty rather than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we can put in flags um, 
So a man is not feminine, a man is not useful, and a man is not necessarily royal. But a woman does have femininity and is probably not considered useful or royal. And you can see where these we've marked off using zeros and ones, but we've made it the matrix the table much richer and more connected. There are fewer zeros. So it's a low dimensional matrix, it's denser data, it keeps the context. The problem is embedding is harder to code. I mentioned this other part about feature engineering or data engineering. This is the scaling and transformation and standardizing. It's to make things more normal or Gaussian distribution. Um, it's to help reduce sort of bimodal peaks in the distribution. Uh, scaling is another one, which is to make sure that you don't have things going from 0 0.0001 to 1.8 billion. You know, the numbers are just too wide, so then you can scale things so that they maybe range from zero to one or zero to two. Um, you want to try and limit outliers because with the outliers, the program will just focus on those or, to, uh, or the learner will focus on those and that messes up performance. So scaling, normalization, uh, transformation, standardization, really, really important for neural net programs. This is just a, a game highlighting what we use in scaling and why it's important. It helps, as I say, improve with model convergence. It stops certain numbers or features from overwhelming the others. That's the outlier problem. Uh, normalizing is basically scaling from everything that ranges from zero to one. Um, and you can convert that in a lot of ways. You can also um, log normalize or log scale. Um, you can also standardize to make sure the values are centered around a mean and that the standard deviation has uh, some smallish value. Again, all of this is a tri are tricks that people use in statistics and machine learning is a form of statistical computing or statistical probabilistic computing. So this is an example where you might have highly skewed data, which is what we get a lot of, and it could be RNA-seq data, proteomics data, um, could be you know, distributions in terms of binding coefficients, um, highly skewed data, clinical uh, information about you know, auditory sense or visual sense or severity of, of trauma or tumor. So you can take a skewed data set and just uh, take the log of all the data, and that will convert this skewed data set to almost a perfect Gaussian or normal distribution. That is the type of data and data set that you need to put into a machine learning algorithm. Feature selection, that's different. As I said, we talked about the scaling and normalization, but feature selection is essentially a way of reducing the amount of data that you have to use in the machine model. It's also making sure that you're choosing the relevant data that is informative and could improve the performance. So if you haven't done a good job with choosing relevant data, your model will do poorly. If you've included lots of irrelevant data, your model will do poorly. And so this is where some human thinking and intervention is critical. Um, you can do feature selection automatically. You can do feature selection manually. Uh, with deep learning methods, in some cases, you don't have to do feature selection at all. Um, but that's not always guaranteed to work. So, you know, schematically, visually, this might be, you know, there's eight different or seven different features we've got here. Uh, we choose ones that just aren't working in terms of their performance. We get rid of them. And so from seven features initially, we shrink it down to three features. And that selection can be done manually, statistically, automatically, semi-automatically, but it usually requires um, some insight about the, the problem. So you can have examples where you're training well, where you've had very little data. So drawing a line between two points, not a good idea. In this case, there's uh, eight, nine points that were missing and Obviously, that's not the correct way of interpreting the data. Um, 
So next step is trying to choose your model and training it. Um, we talked about this before, um, different methods like random forest, ANNs, hidden Markov models. As I said, you don't know which model is it is best and, and the best route in machine learning is to try a few. And the difference between them usually is you know, five to 10%. You shouldn't see something like you know, an 80% difference in performance. But you know, something that's 5% better than the other model, that's probably statistically significant and so use that one. So I'll look at some of the models, the decision trees, the simplest one, it's the simplest one to understand. These have been around forever. Um, people have used decision trees in most things in their life. You know, they take this fork in this path, or you know, if I take this um, ingredient, this means I'll have to choose this other ingredient to complement it. Usually it's, it's splitting data, categorizing data. It's making a decision, is, is this greater than or less than, or is this a yes, no, or is this expensive or cheap? So it's a set of trees. This is an example of survivor a, a decision tree for the Titanic. So the Titanic sank uh, more than 100 years ago, and the rule was women and children first. And so they did an analysis of the survivors of the Titanic. Did they follow the women and children first rule? So the first thing they noticed is that um, most women um, survived, whereas most men didn't. And the next thing that they looked at was age. Um, if among the males, um, did they choose children or did they choose older people? So that those who were older than nine and a half, most died. Those that were less than nine and a half, most lived. But then of the ones that uh, were children, uh, what was the fraction? So if you had um, more children, um, if there's larger families, uh, more of them died. Whereas with smaller families, smaller numbers of kids, most of them survived. So this decision tree tells us that women and children uh, were saved first, and that there are certain decisions about both age and size of family that had an influence about who, who survived. Decisions trees have branches, they have leaves, the leaves are the nodes or the boxes, the, the lines are the branches or edges. The neat thing about decision trees is you don't have to do the data transformation normalization, which is pretty cool. Random forests are essentially a collection of trees. And this makes use of something called ensemble learning or the idea of let's have a bunch of experts. So if you wanna you know, decide about a policy or some you know, significantly challenging problem, you don't usually just consult one person, you consult many. And so that's what ensemble learning is, is consult multiple experts. And from the experts' decisions or ideas, take a majority vote and average, and that gives you your average result. And this has been found repeatedly to do better than just using a single decision tree. Decision trees, especially random forests, can be used for classification, but you can also use them for regression, which means that they can be predictive. Um, anyways, as I say, the random forest is like decisions by committee. Artificial neural nets, these are things we've already mentioned. They try and simulate the activity of the brain using inputs and outputs. Uh, they have units called nodes, and uh, they're connected by um, essentially weight vectors. Uh, a and can be used for regression and classification. Another type of model is called a hidden Markov model. They're also called probabilistic graphical models. Uh, they try and model a Markovian or probabilistic process using hidden um, observations or hidden states. They have emission and transmission or transition probabilities. Um, just things like dynamic programming to optimize the Markov model. People have used them for predicting sequential events, for doing um, gene finding, for doing um, speech recognition, but they've been mostly replaced by LSTMs or long short-term memory systems because those are better and easier to understand. Hidden markup models are really hard to program. Support vector machines, they're not a machine. It's essentially um, 
uh, linear discriminant analysis technique. Um, it uses a transformation uh, tool. It's called a kernel trick to transform things or shift, just like we do PLSDA or PCA to shift things and to find the, what's called the best margin to, to separate things. So you can see the blue dots and sort of the reddish brown dots in this graph. They've been rotated and shifted through this kernel trick and you find the line that separates the, the blue dots from the red dots best. And that's called the best margin. So it's just like, as I say, PLSTA, um, linear discriminant analysis as well. And you can use it just like the thing it ends. You can do it for classification. You can also use it for regression. So different models, we've only talked about a few. There are many now. Um, but once you've chosen and trained your model, and it's now getting some decent performance on your training set, then you need to see how well does it work on other data sets. So it's easy in machine learning to both undertrain and overtrain. That's overtraining being the most common. So these pictures here show examples of undertraining or underfitting, where we've got some data points and we just draw a straight line through it. Overfitting, we're trying to connect every single point to each other, that's overfitting. And then that parabolic line is sort of fitting things just right, it covers it. Um, and so overfitting and underfitting are, are a serious problem in machine learning. And there's ways of making sure you avoid that. Um, and as I said, this is the biggest problem in machine learning, um, which is using too much data. Um, so you might have um, I guess I'll say maybe not too much data, but too many parameters. So, you know, you're, you're just trying to fit um, what probably turns out to be a straight line, but you are using a um, hundred or two hundred different parameters to fit the straight line. And yet, I think you guys should know from math that you know, the equation is y equals mx plus b. So. There's only you know, two parameters you need to work with, but adding 150 parameters will lead to a serious overfit. So to prevent this, people use external validation data sets to make sure they didn't know the train sets having a third data set. They'll do things like cross-validation, they'll do permutation testing. All of these are ways of making sure that you haven't overtrained. So the simplest method is to take their data and divide it to a, a training set, which might be about two thirds of the data, and then having a holdout set about one third. And that holdout set is used to validate or test your performance. When you're training a model, that, that training phase um, means that, that it's not allowed to see the test data ever. It has to be hidden away. Otherwise, you're cheating. Um, and this is a remarkably common problem that people make do or is that they will let their, their models see the test data and they'll report spectacular results when they um, test their test data. But that's because the models learn how to work with the test data. Now, you can, instead of just doing a two-fold separation, two-thirds, one-thirds, you can do n-fold cross-validation. So you can have the data set and divide it, in this case, three groups. You can train on two thirds and test. Then you can swap things around. You can take uh, part of the test data and use that as part of the training. And then you could also do another part. So there's uh, this threefold cross validation. You could do this through three rounds and determine what your performance is um, in, for this algorithm. And you can do this for threefold, you can do this fivefold, you can do this tenfold, or you can do, in this case, maybe a millionfold, which is called the leave one out validation. Train on all but one example, test on that one, and then repeat the process. So this is another way of confirming how robust the model is. 
generally people prefer the informed cost validation. Another way of testing whether things are robust or overfitting is called permutation testing. So you might have, in this case, there's a, a bunch of unlabeled data. You label it. Um, you then run it through your classifier and you see if that classifier can separate these things. So we can see the red and the blue are now separated in the upper right corner. Then what we do is we can take the data that we have here and then we just randomly relabel it. So some of the blues are red, some of the reds are blues, some are not changed. And then you run it through the same classifier as here. And it'll run and most likely it won't be able to separate things because it was trained to separate on this. So you can do this random permutation a hundred times, a thousand times, and you can measure the quality of the separation. This is a good separation, this is a bad one. And you can plot out the separation score. And if you see something way out here like this one, then you can be sure that the permutation is saying that the separation is robust, the performance is robust, it has not been overtrained. Um, so you can calculate a p-value or something like that things to measure whether it's significant. You can also use things like confusion matrices to assess true positives and false positives and false negatives. Uh, um, and I'm looking at the time here because we've probably, are we running a little bit over time right now? We're actually dead on our schedule for our first break. So we were scheduled to take our first break at 12.15 Eastern. Okay. So we still have a number of slides yet to go through on this one. And what I might do is um, we'll, we'll stop here so people can have their break. Uh, I'll, I'll whip through some of the last bits of this presentation so that we'll get up to speed and then I'll switch into module two. Okay. So is that okay for everyone? All right, so I hope everyone had a, at least a, a bit of a break, a chance to take a, a bite to eat. For some of you, a fast lunch, others perhaps a fast dinner. Uh, for us on the West Coast, um, probably just a bit of coffee. Um, so I, I was talking about confusion matrices um, and uh, Um, and how we assess the performance of machine learning models, especially when we're talking about categorical classification, um, things like are healthy or sick, um, alive or dead, or um, cases versus controls. And so the confusion matrix is a way of assessing the quality of a predictor. Um, it's where we talk about true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. And you can have these four categories that are shown in this table on the right. From there, we can also calculate things like sensitivity and specificity, sensitivity being sort of a true positive rate and specificity being the true negative rate. Um, one way of thinking about it is to think of, of clusters or distributions of, 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 in this case, patients. We could think of the blue ones having disease and the orange ones having um, healthy controls. And so with any condition, um, there's probably a range of or distribution of characteristics. It could be uh, maybe your blood glucose levels, or it could be a combination of blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C, but it produces a distribution. Some are very normal, some are high normal, some are low normal. Some with diabetes would be low on one end, but higher on the other. So what you can get is that the, in these four distributions, the fact that they overlap a little bit will be potentially, if you say the control ones are actually the disease ones, or if you say the disease ones are actually control ones, you have either false positives or false negatives. Ones that you predict are being disease and correctly disease, and then they're correctly control and are actually control. Those are true positives, in this case, true negatives. Sensitivity and specificity are given by these equations that I've written at the bottom here. But if we have distributions, we can also calculate something called a receiver operator characteristic curve or rock curve. 
And this is uh, another way of assessing performance of some kind of classifier or predictor. Uh, it's commonly used in biomarkers. It's commonly used in uh, performance and predictive tests of, of any number of things in biology and bioinformatics. So a rock curve is a graphical plot of the true positive rate and the false positive rate for some kind of categorical or binary classifier. So we can think of those categories, the distributions that I showed between the healthy and the sick. Um, this is the little distribution here. And then we can start dividing things with this rainbow color of lines. So I've just drawn a line, um, the brown line, where it's sort of in the middle of the healthy distribution. And then I can draw a red and an orange and a yellow and a green and a blue and violet lines as I move to the right. And I'll be cutting off those distributions and counting which ones, how many times I'm correct. And if I have a different cutoff, I'll have maybe not perfectly correct, I'll include some false negatives or false positives. So with each of these lines, I can plot out the percentage of true positives and the percentage of false positives. And those are plotted out here. So there's the brown line and there's the brown dot at the very top. And there's the orange line over here, um, lighter orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. These correspond to the cutoffs. And so we see that we've gone from having perfect true positive rate to a, and to the moderate false positive rate. But then we can go down to the point here where we have almost no true positives and no false positives. Um, so that's not a good cutoff. Uh, we can draw a line with all through all seven or eight points, and that's the rock curve. And then we can sort of decide what point do we want to trade off between best sensitivity and best specificity. We choose this region, we choose this region, but the best trade off is this region. And that's the cutoff. And so that corresponds to sort of the yellow orange um, lines, which separates the two distributions pretty nicely. So we don't get a perfect um, true positive and we don't get a perfect false positive rate. Well, in fact, we want to try and minimize our false positive rate as well. Um, so this gives us uh, our best sensitivity and our best specificity, and then we can calculate the area under the curve. And if we have a curve that looks like the one on the upper left, that's a pretty good performance. If we have an area under the curve like this, which is sort of this diagonal line, that's about as, that's a random guess. Um, and so we can talk about the performance of classifiers or predictors based on the area under the curve. And if you can produce a curve or separation that's perfect, so the two distributions are well separated, um, then this would be sort of what we saw here. This is a nicely separated group. Um, then that would give us a perfect 100% area under the curve like that. Most things, most predictors, most machine learning classifiers get something between this and this. Getting something like this is very rare in biology. So these are some of the tests that you'll do to assess the performance. Um, and um, as I said, it's a matter of always testing with your holdout data set or your validation data set and to assess the performance. Once you've tested, once you are satisfied that things are robust, things are performing as, as you expect, then you can start making those things available for predictions. So in our group, whenever we've got a, a really good model and we're really happy with it, we'll publish it and we'll put it online and we make servers. So this is the one model that predicts uh, mass spectra data and it does really well. And so this is an example of a predictor that's uh, been robustly verified and validated. We've done the same thing with other thing, tools for secondary structure prediction with neural nets. Again, we make it into a server, make it publicly available, but only after we've done very careful validation, very careful checking confirmation about robustness. So what we're gonna do uh, in the next little while here, uh, both with module two, three, and four, is we're gonna give you uh, some idea about two types of machine learning models, a decision tree and an artificial neural net. 
we're going to apply them to three different biological problems. One is a general classification problem. One is in the area of protein secondary structure prediction. And the other one is in gene finding. So these are not bleeding edge applications. But this is a course, as I said, that's intended to introduce you to machine learning so that you, then you can jump into the other areas. And generally, if you have a good grounding in this, it's not hard to start applying these tools into the other applications. We're going to dive into the algorithms. We're going to look at the code. We're going to focus on Python, although the R code is available if you want to look at it outside of the class. And we're going to use Google Colab. Tomorrow, we're going to show you how you can do the same machine learning tests and convert the code that was fairly difficult can be quickly coded using uh, scikit-learn, making, I think, a lot of machine learning applications a whole lot easier than what they used to be when I started out in the field of machine learning 20 years ago. So what we would normally do if we had lots of time is we, and this is what was done as the pre-reading, is you guys had introductions to the Google Colab, how to set up Google accounts, how to make sure that your account is working, uh, where to go and to collab, how to get your drives and file folders, how to upload things to make sure that you're in the machine learning pro, um, collab set, that you're able to access different programs, uh, installing the collab app on your computers, going to the collab main page, the notebook, creating your first notebook, how to do it and how to get the title. Uh, some text about how you can use the new Gemini pilot, co-pilot in Google Colab. So all of this is something you should have gone through. If you haven't, uh, you're going to need to go through this shortly. Um, this is just quickly, if you wanted to create a, a notebook for Hello World, this is an exercise that we could hope some of you would try and do. Um, so create this notebook, enter this program. Uh, which is hello world and print your name um, and uh, how to use the run cell to actually run the program. So this is a nice thing about um, both Colab and the Python system. Um, if you wanted to run more complicated programs where you might use libraries, you will have to import uh, certain types of libraries like NumPy and Pandas and um, warning libraries. Just NumPy is something you'll see a fair bit in the next um, day or day and a half. So it's a library for Python. It does allows you to handle multi-dimensional arrays and matrices. This is what you need to use a lot in, in machine learning, um, especially for neural net systems. And then Pandas is, is essentially for data ma manipulation. So you can read in CSV or text files uh, and you can convert those into data frames. So we have rows and columns again. Uh, also useful for data matrices. So this is an example where we're looking at the hidden Markov model. We're not going to use one, but it was written in Panda or in Python. And we're using um, the Pandas um, reading function uh, to, to read the CSV files. Um, we're also showing how you can click on folders. So if you have to upload data on the left side, there's a folder. Um, and this allows you then to, to select data files. Sometimes we need data files to run the programs. And so this is how you do it in Colab. And so those data files can be either accessed by dragging and dropping, or you can do a shift click with your mouse uh, to get those files into the program. Once you've done that, you can see that we've taken two, one TXT file and one CSV file. And these have now been loaded into this um, Python program um, so that the code can read them. You can run code through either clicking the, the little arrow, or you can also go up to the runtime um, menu option and then just click run all. So that'll take all of the cells, um, everything at once. So these are, again, part of what was supposed to be your initial reading. If you're completely flummoxed by some of this, we'll explain it and we'll show you, we'll walk you through a few of these in the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes. Um, as I said, R has also been developed, we've developed R code for most of the examples, but we'll be working with Python just for the sake of time. 
Um, you can run a CoLab notebook in R. Um, R is a slower programming uh, language. It's in the sense of the run times tend to take quite a bit longer. Uh, we've given you guys a link uh, already in terms of where the code repository is, also where the slides, also where the data is. So hopefully everyone has found that. And this is how you can navigate, and this is how you'll see the different modules, um, both with respect to code and Python code, R code, and you'll see the slides. One of the things that's happened in the last five or 10 years is that you know, machine learning has become much more accessible. Um, we're going to show you, you know, how tough it was uh, or is in terms of coding from original material, but we're also going to show you how you can use uh, scikit-learn and other tools to make machine learning programming a whole lot easier. Um, these are examples, Microsoft's into it, Google's into it, Facebook's into it. The original machine learning interface was something developed in New Zealand called Weka, um, which is how I got my first exposure to machine learning. Um, but there are all these tools um, that now make coding a whole lot simpler um, because it sort of modularized a lot of the uh, tools. So we'll talk about these tomorrow, but I really want people to become aware of what's inside these tools. And that's what we'll focus on today. So this is just a quick wrap up in terms of what machine learning is. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, and I think to emphasize that machine learning has been and is and will be used a lot in bioinformatics. It's, it's one of the hottest areas in bioinformatics and deep learning is one of the hottest areas in science. Um, the applications are appearing all over the place, and in some cases, just simply being aware of how to access the programs and knowing how to run them is um, your superpower. Um, what this course will be doing really is to just give you an understanding of, of how these things are working. And for those of you who want to do a deeper dive, we're hoping that this opens the door for you to do that. But we're not going to make you all experts in two days. The other thing to remember is that a lot of the techniques in machine learning uh, that I'm talking about can, can effectively be done through things that we call multivariate statistics. Uh, particularly partially squared discriminant analysis is formally a machine learning method. And um, unsupervised clustering like PCA, that hierarchical clustering, also a form of machine learning. So we call them multivariate statistics. They emerged from the field of statistics. But this is why a lot of machine learning is really formally or informally uh, statistical programming or probabilistic programming. Um, so it's important to know that these things are largely the same. They just have different names and somewhat slightly different origins.